Section 6 of The Genealogy of Morals by Friedrich Nietzsche. Third essay. What is the meaning of ascetic ideals? Part 2. 12. Granted that such an incarnate will for contradiction and unnaturalness is induced to philosophize, on what will it vent its pet caprice? On that which has been felt with the greatest certainty to be true, to be real, it will look for error in those very places where the life instinct fixes truth with the greatest positiveness. It will, for instance, after the example of the ascetics of the Vedanta philosophy, reduce matter to an illusion, and similarly treat pain, multiplicity, the whole logical contrast of subject and object, errors, nothing but errors. To renounce the belief in one's own ego, to deny to oneself one's own reality, what a triumph! And here already we have a much higher kind of triumph, which is not merely a triumph over the senses, over the palpable, but an infliction of violence and cruelty on reason. And this ecstasy culminates in the ascetic self-contempt, the ascetic scorn of one's own reason making this decree. There is a domain of truth and of life, but reason is specifically excluded therefrom. By the by, even in the Kantian idea of the intelligible character of things, there remains a trace of that schism, so dear to the heart of the ascetic, that schism which likes to turn reason against reason. In fact, intelligible character means in Kant a kind of quality in things of which the intellect comprehends so much, that for it the intellect it is absolutely incomprehensible. After all, let us in our character of knowers not be ungrateful towards such determined reversals of the ordinary perspectives and values, with which the mind had for too long raged against itself with an apparently futile sacrilege. In the same way, the very seeing of another vista, the very wishing to see another vista, is no little training and preparation of the intellect for its eternal objectivity. Objectivity being understood not as contemplation without interest, for that is inconceivable and nonsensical, but as the ability to have the pros and cons in one's power and to switch them on and off, so as to get to know how to utilize, for the advancement of knowledge, the difference in the perspective and in the emotional interpretations. But let us forsooth, my philosophic colleagues, henceforward guard ourselves more carefully against this mythology of dangerous ancient ideals which has set up a pure, willless, painless, timeless subject of knowledge. Let us guard ourselves from the tentacles of such contradictory ideas as pure reason, absolute spirituality, knowledge in itself. In these theories an eye that cannot be thought of is required to think, an eye which ex hypothesis has no direction at all, an eye in which the active and interpreting functions are cramped, are absent. Those functions, I say, by means of which abstract seeing first became seeing something. In these theories, consequently the absurd and the nonsensical is always demanded of the eye. There is only a seeing from a perspective, only a knowing from a perspective, and the more emotions we express over the thing, the more eyes, different eyes, we train on the same thing, the more complete will our idea of that thing, our objectivity. But the elimination of the wheel altogether, the switching off of the emotions all and sundry, granted that we could do so, what? Would not that be called intellectual castration? 13. But let us turn back. Such a self-contradiction as apparently manifests itself among the ascetics, life turned against life, is, so much is absolutely obvious, from the physiological and not now from the psychological standpoint, simply nonsense. It can only be an apparent contradiction. It must be a kind of provisional expression, an explanation, a formula, an adjustment, a psychological misunderstanding of something whose real nature could not be understood for a long time and whose real essence could not be described, a mere word jammed into an old gap of human knowledge. To put briefly the facts against its being real, the ascetic ideal springs from the prophylactic and self-preservative instincts which mark a decadent life, which seeks by every means in its power to maintain its position and fight for its existence. It points to a partial physiological depression and exhaustion, against which the most profound and intact life instincts fight ceaselessly with new weapons and discoveries. The ascetic ideal is such a weapon. 
Its position is consequently exactly the reverse of that which the worshippers of the ideal imagine. Life struggles in it and through it with death and against death. The ascetic ideal is a dodge for the preservation of life. An important fact is brought out in the extent to which, as history teaches, this ideal could rule and exercise power over man, especially in all those places where the civilization and taming of man was completed. That fact is the diseased state of man up to the present, at any rate, of the man who has been tamed, the physiological struggle of man with death, more precisely with the disgust with life, with exhaustion, with the wish for the end. The ascetic priest is the incarnate wish for an existence of another kind, an existence on another plane. He is, in fact, the highest point of this wish, its official ecstasy and passion. But it is the very power of this wish which is to fetter that binds him here. It is just that which makes him into a tool that must labor to create more favorable conditions for earthly existence. For existence on the human plane, it is with this very power that he keeps the whole herd of failures, distortions, abortions, unfortunate sufferers from themselves of every kind, fast to existence, while he as the herdsman goes instinctively on in front. You understand me already, this ascetic priest, this apparent enemy of life, this denier, he actually belongs to the really great conservative and affirmative forces of life. What does it come from, this diseased state? For man is more diseased, more uncertain, more changeable, more unstable than any other animal. There is no doubt about it. He is the diseased animal. What does it spring from? Certainly he has also dared, innovated, braved more, challenged fate more than all the other animals put together. He, the great experimenter with himself, the unsatisfied, the insatiate, who struggles for the supreme mastery with beast, nature, and gods. He, the as yet ever uncompelled, the ever future, who finds no more any rest from his own aggressive strength goaded inexorably on by the spur of the future dug into the flesh of the present. How should not so brave and rich an animal also be the most endangered, the animal with the longest and deepest sickness among all sick animals? Man is sick of it, often enough there are whole epidemics of this satiety, as about 1348, at the time of the dance of death. But even this very nausea, this tiredness, this disgust with himself, all this is discharged from him with such force that it is immediately made into a new fetter. His nay, which he utters to life, brings to light, as though by magic an abundance of graceful yeas. Even when he wounds himself, this master of destruction, of self-destruction, it is subsequently the wound itself that forces him to live. 14. The more normal is this sickliness in man, and we cannot dispute this normality. The higher honor should be paid to the rare cases of psychical and physical powerfulness, the windfalls of humanity, and the more strictly should the sound be guarded from the worst of air, the air of the sick room. Is that done? The sick are the greatest danger for the healthy. It is not for the strongest that harm comes from the strong, but from the weakest. Is that known? Broadly considered, it is not for a minute the fear of man whose diminution should be wished for. For this fear forces the strong to be strong, to be at times terrible. It preserves in its integrity the sound type of man. What is to be feared? What does work with a fatality found in no other fate? Is not the great fear of, but the great nausea with man. And equally so the great pity for man. Supposing that both these things were one day to espouse each other, then inevitably the maximum of monstrousness would immediately come into the world, the last will of man, his will for nothingness, nihilism. And in sooth, the way is well paved thereto. He who not only has his nose to smell, but also has his eyes and ears, he sniffs about wherever he goes today an air something like that of a madhouse, the air of a hospital, I am speaking, as stands to reason, of the cultured areas of mankind, of every kind of Europe that there is, in fact, in the world. The sick are the great danger of man, not the evil, not the beasts of prey. They who are from the outset botched, oppressed, broken, those are they, the weakest are they, who most undermine the life beneath the feet of man, who instill the most dangerous venom and skepticism into our trust of life. 
in man and ourselves? Where shall we escape from it, from that covert look from which we carry away a deep sadness, from that averted look of him who is misborn from the beginning, that look which betrays what such a man says to himself, that look which is a groan? Would that I were something else, so groans this look, but there is no hope. I am what I am, how could I get away from myself, and verily I am sick of myself. On such a soil of self-contempt, a veritable swamp soil grows that weed, that poisonous growth, and all so tiny, so hidden, so ignoble, so sugary. Here teem the worms of revenge and vindictiveness, here the air reeks of things secret and unmentionable. Here is ever spun the net of the most malignant conspiracy, the conspiracy of the sufferers against the sound and the victorious. Here is the sigh of the most victorious hated. And what lying so as not to acknowledge this hate as hate? What a show of big words and attitudes. What an art of righteous calumniation. These abortions. What a noble eloquence gushes from their lips. What an amount of sugary, slimy, humble submission oozes in their eyes. What do they really want? At any rate, to represent righteousness, love, wisdom, superiority, that is the ambition of these lowest ones, these sick ones. And how clever does such an ambition make them? You cannot, in fact, but admire the counterfeiter dexterity with which the stamp of virtue, even the ring, the golden ring of virtue, is here imitated. They have taken a lease of virtue absolutely for themselves, have these weaklings and wretched invalids, there is no doubt about it. We alone are the good, the righteous, so do they speak. We alone are the omnes bonche voluntatis. They stalk about in our midst as living reproaches, as warnings for us, as though health, fitness, strength, pride, the sensation of power were really vicious things in themselves for which one would have some day to do penance, bitter penance. Oh, how they themselves are ready in their hearts to exact penance, how they thirst after being hangmen. Among them is an abundance of revengeful ones disguised as judges, who ever mouth the word righteousness like the venomous spittle. With mouth, I say, always pursed, always ready to spit at everything, which does not wear a discontented look but is of good cheer as it goes on its way. Among them again is that most loathsome species of the vain, the lying abortions, who make a point of representing beautiful souls, and perchance of bringing to the market as purity of heart the distorted sensualism swathed in verses and other bandages, the species of self-comforters and masturbators of their own souls, the sick man's will to represent some form or other of superiority, his instinct for crooked paths which lead to a tyranny over the healthy. Where can it not be found this will to power of the very weakest? The sick woman especially. No one surpasses her in refinements for ruling, oppressing, tyrannizing. The sick woman, moreover, spares nothing living, nothing dead. She grubs up again the most buried things. The bogos say woman is a hyena. Look into the background of every family, of every body, of every community. Everywhere the fight of the sick against the healthy, a silent fight for the most part, with minute poison powders, with pin pricks, with spiteful grimaces of patience, but also at times with that diseased pharisaism of pure pantomime, which plays for the choice role of righteous indignation. Right into the hallowed chambers of knowledge can it make itself heard, can this hoarse yelping of sick hounds, this rabid lying and frenzy of such noble pharisees i remind readers who have ears once more of that berlin apostle of revenge eugen during who makes most disreputable and revolting use in all present-day germany of moral refuse during the paramount moral blusterer that there is today even among his own kind the anti-semites they are all men of resentment are these physiological distortions and warm riddled objects a whole quivering kingdom of burrowed revenge indefatigable and insatiable in its outbursts against the happy and equally so in disguises for a revenge and pretexts for revenge when will they really reach their final fondest most sublime triumph of revenge 
at that time doubtless when they succeed in pushing their own misery in fact all misery into the consciousness of the happy so that the latter begin one day to be ashamed of their happiness and perchance say to themselves when they meet it is a shame to be happy there is too much misery but there cannot possibly be a greater and more fatal misunderstanding than that of the happy the fit the strong in body and soul beginning in this way to doubt the right to happiness away with this perverse world away with this shameful soddenness of sentiment preventing the sick making the healthy sick for that is what such a soddenness comes to this ought to be our supreme object in the world but for this it is above all essential that the healthy should remain separated from the sick that they should even guard themselves from the look of the sick that they should not even associate with the sick or may it perchance be their mission to be nurses or doctors but they could not mistake and disown their mission more grossly the higher must not degrade itself to be the tool of the lower the pathos of distance must to all eternity keep their missions also separate the right of the happy to existence the right of bells with a full tone over the discordant cracked bells is verily a thousand times greater they alone are the sureties of the future they alone are bound to man's future what they can what they must do that can the sick never do should never do but if they are to be enabled to do what only they must do how can they possibly be free to play the doctor the comforter the savior of the sick and therefore good air good air and away at any rate from the neighborhood of all the madhouses and hospitals of civilization and therefore good company our own company or solitude if it must be so but away at any rate from the evil fumes of internal corruption and the secret worm-eaten state of the sick that forsooth my friends we may defend ourselves at any rate for still a time against the two worst plagues that could have been reserved for us against the great nausea with man against the great pity for man fifteen if you have understood in all their depths and i demand that you should grasp them profoundly and understand them profoundly the reasons for the impossibility of its being the business of the healthy to nurse the sick to make the sick healthy it follows that you have grasped this further necessity the necessity of doctors and nurses who themselves are sick and now we have and hold with both our hands the essence of the ascetic priest the ascetic priest must be accepted by us as the predestined savior herdsman and champion of the sick herd thereby do we first understand his awful historic mission the lordship over sufferers is his kingdom to that point his instinct in that he finds his own special art his master skill his kind of happiness he must himself be sick he must be kith and kin to the sick and the abortions so as to understand them so as to arrive at an understanding with them but he must also be strong even more master of himself than of others impregnable forsooth in his will for power so as to acquire the trust and the awe of the weak so that he can be their hold bulwark prop compulsion overseer tyrant god he has to protect them protect his herds against whom against the healthy doubtless also against the envy towards the healthy he must be the natural adversary and scorner of every rough stormy rainless hard violent predatory health and power the priest is the first form of the most delicate animal that scorns more easily than it hates he will not be spared the waging of war with a beast of prey a war of guile of spirit rather than of force as is self-evident he will in certain cases find it necessary to conjure up out of himself or at any rate to represent practically a new type of the beast of prey a new animal monstrosity in which the polar bear the supple cold crouching panther and not least important the fox are joined together in a trinity as fascinating as it is fearsome if necessity exacts it then will he come on the scene with bearish seriousness venerable wise cold full of treacherous superiority as the herald and mouthpiece of mysterious powers sometimes going among even the other kinds of beasts of prey determined as he is to sow on their soil wherever he can suffering discord self-contradiction and only too sure of his art always to be lord of sufferers at all times he brings with him doubtless salve and balsam 
but before he can play the physician he must first wound. So, while he soothes the pain with which the wound makes, he at the same time poisons the wound. Well versed is he in this above all things, is this wizard and wild beast and tamer, in whose vicinity everything healthy must needs become ill, and everything ill must needs become tame. He protects and sooth his sick herd well enough, does this strange herdsman. He protects them against themselves, against the sparks, even in the center of the herd, of wickedness, knavery, malice, and all the other ills that the plaguey and the sick are heir to. He fights with cunning, hardness, and stealth against anarchy and against the ever imminent break-up inside the herd, where resentment, that most dangerous blasting stuff and explosive, ever accumulates and accumulates, getting rid of this blasting stuff in such a way that it does not blow up the herd and the herdsmen, that is his real feat, his supreme utility. If you wish to comprise in the shortest formula the value of the priestly life, it would be correct to say the priest is the diverter of the course of resentment. Every sufferer, in fact, searches instinctively for a cause of his suffering. To put it more exactly, a doer, to put it still more precisely, a sentient responsible doer. In brief, something living on which, either actually or in effigy, he can on any pretext vent his emotions. For the venting of emotions is the sufferer's greatest attempt at alleviation, that is to say, stupefaction, is mechanically desired narcotic against pain of any kind. It is in this phenomenon alone that is found, according to my judgment, the real physiological cause of resentment, revenge, and their family is to be found, that is, in a demand for the deadening of pain through emotion. This cause is generally, but in my view very erroneously, looked for the defensive parry of a bare protective principle of reaction, of a reflex movement in the case of any sudden hurt and danger, after the manner that a decapitated frog still moves in order to get away from a corrosive acid. But the difference is fundamental. In one case the object is to prevent being hurt any more, in the other case the object is to deaden a racking, insidious, nearly unbearable pain by a more violent emotion of any kind whatsoever, and at any rate for the time being to drive it out of the consciousness. For this purpose an emotion is needed, as wild an emotion as possible, and to excite that emotion some excuse or other is needed. It must be somebody's fault that I feel bad. This kind of reasoning is peculiar to all invalids, and is but the more pronounced, the more ignorant they remain of the real cause of their feeling bad, the physiological cause, the cause may lie in a disease of the nervous sympathicus, or in an excessive secretion of bile, or in a want of sulfate and phosphate of potash in the blood, or in pressure in the bowels which stops the circulation in the blood, or in degeneration of the ovaries, and so forth. All sufferers have an awful resourcefulness and ingenuity in finding excuses for painful emotions. They even enjoy their jealousy, their broodings over base actions and apparent injuries. They burrow through the intestines of their past and present in their search for obscure mysteries, wherein they will be at liberty to wallow in a torturing suspicion and get drunk on the venom of their own malice. They tear open the oldest wounds, they make themselves bleed from the scars which have long been healed. They make evildoers out of friends, wife, child, and everything which is nearest to them. I suffer. It must be somebody's fault. So thinks every sick sheep. But his herdsman, the ascetic priest, says to him, Quite so, my sheep. It must be the fault of someone. But thou thyself art that same one. It is all the fault of thyself alone. It is all the fault of thyself alone against thyself. That is bold enough, false enough, but one thing is at least attained thereby. As I have said, the course of resentment is diverted. 16. You can see now what remedial instinct of life has at least tried to effect, according to my conception, through the ascetic priest, and the purpose for which he had to employ a temporary tyranny of such paradoxical and anomalous ideas as guilt, sin, sinfulness, corruption, damnation. What was done was to make the sick harmless up to a certain point, to destroy the incurable by means of themselves, to turn the milder cases severely onto themselves, to give the resentment a backwards direction. 
man needs but one thing and to exploit similarly the bad instincts of all sufferers with a view to self-discipline self-surveillance self-mastery it is obvious that there can be no question at all in the case of a medication of this kind a mere emotional medication of any real healing of the sick in the physiological sense it cannot even for a moment be asserted that in this connection the instinct of life has taken healing as its goal and purpose on the one hand a kind of congestion and organization of the sick the word church is the most popular name for it on the other a kind of provisional safeguarding of the comparatively healthy the more perfect specimens the cleavage of a rift between healthy and sick for a long time that was all and it was much it was very much i am proceeding as you see in this essay from an hypothesis which as far as such readers as i want are concerned does not require to be proved the hypothesis that sinfulness in man is not an actual fact but rather the interpretation of a fact of a physiological discomfort, a discomfort seen through a moral religious perspective, which is no longer binding upon us. The fact, therefore, that anyone feels guilty, shameful, is certainly not yet any proof that he is right in feeling so, any more than anyone who is healthy simply because he feels healthy. Remember the celebrated witch ordeals. In those ideas, the most acute and humane judges had no doubt, but that in these cases they were confronted with guilt. The witches themselves had no doubt on this point, and yet the guilt was lacking. Let me elaborate this hypothesis. I do not for a minute accept the very pain in the soul as a real fact, but only as an explanation, a causal explanation, of facts that could not hitherto be precisely formulated. I regard it therefore as something as yet absolutely in the air, and devoid of scientific cogency. Just the nice fat word in the place of a lean note of interrogation. When anyone fails to get rid of his pain in the soul, the cause is, speaking crudely, to be found not in his soul, but more probably in his stomach. Speaking crudely, I repeat, but by no means wishing thereby that you should listen to me or understand me in a crude spirit. A strong and well-constituted man digests his experiences, deeds and misdeeds all included, just as he digests his meats, even when he has some tough morsels to swallow. If he fails to relieve himself of an experience, this kind of indigestion is quite as much physiological as the other indigestion, and indeed in more ways than one, simply one of the results of the other. You can adopt such a theory and yet entre nous be nevertheless the strongest opponent of all materialism. 17. But is he really a physician, this ascetic priest? We already understand why we are scarcely allowed to call him a physician, however much he likes to feel a savior and let himself be worshipped as a savior. It is only the actual suffering, the discomfort of the sufferer, which he combats, not its cause, not the actual state of sickness. This needs must constitute our most radical objection to the priestly medication. But just once put yourself into that point of view, of which the priests have a monopoly, you will find it hard to exhaust your amazement at what from that standpoint he has completely seen, sought, and found. The mitigation of suffering, every kind of consoling, all this manifests itself as his very genius. With what ingenuity has he interpreted his mission to, of consoler? With what aplomb and audacity has he chosen weapons necessary for the part? Christianity in particular should be dubbed a great treasure chamber of ingenious consolations such a store of refreshing soothing deadening drugs as it accumulated within itself so many of the most dangerous and daring expedients has it hazarded with such subtlety refinement oriental refinement has it divined what emotional stimulants can conquer at any rate for a time the deep depression the leaden fatigue the black melancholy of physiological cripples for speaking generally all religions are mainly concerned with fighting a certain fatigue and heaviness that has infected everything you can regard it as prima facie probable that in certain places in the world there was almost bound to prevail from time to time among large masses of the population a sense of physiological depression which however owing to their lack of physiological knowledge did not appear to their consciousness as such so that consequently its cause and its cure can only be sought and essayed in the science of moral psychology 
This, in fact, is my most general formula for what is generally called a religion. Such a feeling of depression can have the most diverse origins, and may be the result of the crossing of two heterogeneous races, or of classes. Genealogical and racial differences are also brought out of the classes. The European Weltschmerz, the pessimism of the 19th century, is really the result of an absurd and sudden class mixture. It may be brought about by a mistaken emigration, a race falling into a climate for which its power of adaptation is insufficient, the case of the Persians in India. It may be the effect of old age and fatigue, the Parisian pessimism from 1850 onwards. It may be the wrong diet, the alcoholism of the Middle Ages, the nonsense of vegetarianism, which, however, have in their favor the authority of Sir Christopher and Shakespeare. It may be blood, deterioration, malaria, syphilis, and the like. German depression after thirty years' war, which infected half of Germany with evil diseases and thereby paved the way for German civility, for German pusillanimity. In such a case there is invariably recourse to a war on a grand scale with the feeling of depression. Let us inform ourselves briefly on its most important practices and phases. I leave on one side, as stands to reason, the actual philosophic war against the feeling of depression, which is usually simultaneous. It is interesting enough, but too absurd, too practically negligible, too full of cobwebs, too much of a hole and corner affair, especially when pain is proved to be a mistake, on the naive hypothesis that pain must needs vanish when the mistake underlying it is recognized. But behold, it does anything but vanish. That dominant depression is primarily fought by weapons which reduce the consciousness of life itself to the lowest degree. Wherever possible, no more wishes, no more wants, shun everything which produces emotion, which produces blood, eating no salt, the faker hygiene, no love, no hate, equanimity, no revenge, no getting rich, no work, begging as far as possible, no woman, or as little woman as possible. As far as the intellect is concerned, Pascal's principle, il faut s'habiter, to put the result in ethical and psychological language, self-annihilation, sanctification, to put it in physiological language, hypnotism, the attempt to find some approximate human equivalent for what hibernation is for certain animals, for what estivation is for many tropical plants, a minimum of assimilation and metabolism in which life just manages to subsist without really coming up into consciousness. An amazing amount of human energy has been devoted to this object, perhaps uselessly? There cannot be the slightest doubt but that such sportsmen of saintliness, in whom at times nearly every nation has abounded, have really found a genuine relief from that which they have combated with such a rigorous training. In countless cases they really escaped by the help of their system of hypnotism away from deep physiological depression. Their method is consequently counted among the most universal ethnological facts. Similarly, it is improper to consider such a plan for starving the physical element and its desires, as in itself a symptom of insanity, as a clumsy species of roast beef eating free thinkers and Sir Christophers are fain to do. All the more certain is it that their method can and does pave the way of, to all kinds of mental disturbances, for instance, inner lights, as far as the case of the Heyshets of Mount Althos, auditory and visual hallucinations, voluptuous ecstasies and effervescences of sensualism, the history of St. Teresa. The explanation of such events given by the victims is always the acme of fanatical falsehood. This is self-evident. Note well, however, the tone of the implicit gratitude that rings in the very will for an explanation of such character. The supreme state, salvation itself, that final goal of universal hypnosis and peace, is always regarded by them as the mystery of mysteries, which even the most supreme symbols are inadequate to express. It is regarded as an entry and homecoming to the essence of things, as a liberation from all illusions, as knowledge, as truth, as being, as an escape from every end, every wish, every action, as something even beyond good and evil. Good and evil, quoth the Buddhists, both are fetters, the perfect man is master of them both. The done and the undone, quoth the disciple of the Vandanta, do him no hurt, the good and the evil he shakes off from him, sage that he is, 
his kingdom suffers no more from any act, good and evil, he goes beyond them both. An absolutely Indian conception, as much Brahmanist as Buddhist, neither in the Indian nor in the Christian doctrine is this redemption regarded as attainable by means of virtue and moral improvement. However high they may place the value of the hypnotic efficiency of virtue, keep clear on this point, indeed it simply corresponds with the facts. The fact that they remain true on this point is perhaps to be regarded as the best specimen of realism in the three great religions, absolutely soaked as they are with morality, with this one objection. For those who know there is no duty, redemption is not attained by the acquisition of virtues, for redemption consists in being one with Brahman, who is incapable of acquiring any perfection, and equally little does it consist in the giving up of faults, for the Brahman, unity with whom is what constitutes redemption, is eternally pure. These passages are from the commentaries on the Kankara, quoted from the first real European expert of the Indian philosophy, my friend Paul Doyson. We wish therefore to pay honor to the idea of redemption in the great religions, but it is somewhat hard to remain serious in view of the appreciation meted out to the deep sleep by these exhausted pessimists, who are too tired even to dream, to the deep sleep considered, that is, an, as already effusing into Brahman, as the attainment of the unio mystica with God. When he has completely gone to sleep, says on this point the oldest and most venerable script, and comes to perfect rest, so that he sees no more any vision, then, O oh dear one, is he united with being, he has entered into his own self, encircled by the self with its absolute knowledge, he has no more any consciousness of that which is without, or of that which is within. Day and night cross not these bridges, nor age, nor deaths, nor suffering, nor good deeds, nor evil deeds. In deep sleep, say similarly the believers in this deepest of the three great religions, does the soul lift itself from out of this body of ours, enters the supreme light and stands out therein in its true shape. Therein is it the supreme spirit itself, which travels about while it rests and plays and enjoys itself, whether with women or chariots or friends, there do its thoughts turn no more back to this appanage of a body, to which the prana, the vital breath, is harnessed like a beast of burden to the cart. Nonetheless, we will take care to realize, as we did when discussing redemption, that in spite of all its pomps of oriental extravagance, this simply expresses the same criticism on life as did the clear, cold, Greekly cold, but yet still suffering Epicurus. The hypnotic sensation of nothingness, the peace of deepest sleep, anesthesia in short, that is what passes with the sufferers and the absolutely depressed for, forsooth, their supreme good their value of values, that is what must be measured by them as something positive, be felt by them as the essence of all the positive. According to the same logic of the feelings, nothingness is in all pessimistic religions called God. 18. Such a hypnotic deadening of sensibility and susceptibility to pain, which presupposes somewhat rare powers, especially courage, contempt of opinion, intellectual stoicism, is less frequent than another and certainly easier training which is tried against the states of depression. I mean mechanical activity. It is indisputable that a suffering existence can be thereby considerably alleviated. This fact is called today by the somewhat ignoble title of the blessing of work. The alleviation consists in the attention of the sufferer being absolutely diverted from suffering, in the incessant monopoly of this consciousness by action so that consequently there is little room left for suffering, for narrow is it, this chamber of human consciousness. Mechanical activity and its corollaries, such as absolute regularity, punctilious unreasoning obedience, the chronic routine of life, the complete occupation of time, a certain liberty to be impersonal, nay, a training in an impersonality, self-forgetfulness, incuria sui, with what thoroughness and expert subtlety have all these methods been exploited by the ascetic priest in his war with pain? When he has to tackle sufferers of the lowest orders, slaves or prisoners or women, who for the most part are a compound of labor slave and prisoner, 
All he has to do is to juggle a little with the names, and to rechristen, so as to make them see henceforth a benefit, a comparative happiness, in objects which they hated. The slave's discontent with his lot was at any rate not invented by the priests. An even more popular means of fighting depression is the ordaining of a little joy, which is easily accessible and can be made into a rule. This medication is frequently used in conjunction with the former ones. The most frequent form in which joy is prescribed as a cure is the joy in producing joy, such as doing good, giving presents, alleviating, helping, exhorting, comforting, praising, treating with distinction, together with the prescription of love your neighbor. The ascetic priest prescribes, though in the most cautious doses, what is practically a stimulation of the strongest and most life-assertive impulse, the will to power. The happiness involved in the smallest superiority, which is the concomitant of all benefiting, helping, extolling, making oneself useful, is the most ample consolation, of which, if they are well advised, physiological distortions avail themselves. In other cases they hurt each other, and naturally in obedience to the same radical instinct. An investigation of the origin of Christianity in the Roman world shows that cooperative unions for poverty, sickness, and burial sprang up in the lowest stratum of contemporary society, amid which the chief antidote against depression, the little joy experienced in mutual benefits, was deliberately fostered. Perchance this was then novelty, a real discovery? This conjuring up of the will for cooperation, for family organization, for communal life, for ke nakula, necessarily brought the will to power, which had been already infinitesimally stimulated, to a new and much fuller manifestation. The herd organization is a genuine advance and triumph in the fight with depression. With the growth of the community there matures even to individuals a new interest, which often enough takes him out of the more personal element in his discontent, his aversion to himself, the despecta sui of Gelunux. All sick and diseased people strive instinctively after a herd organization, out of a desire to shake off their sense of oppressive discomfort and weakness. The ascetic priest divines this instinct and promotes it. Wherever a herd exists, it is the instinct of weakness which has wished for the herd, and the cleverness of the priest which has organized it. For mark this, by an equally natural necessity the strong strive as much for isolation as the weak for union. When the former bind themselves it is only with a view to an aggressive joint action and joint satisfaction of their will to power, much against the wishes of their individual consciences. The latter on the contrary arrange themselves together with positive delight in such a muster. Their instincts are as much gratified thereby as the instincts of the born master that is the solitary beast of prey species of man, are disturbed and wounded to the quick by organization. There is always lurking beneath every oligarchy, such as the universal lesson of history, the desire for tyranny. Every oligarchy is continually quivering with the tension of the effort required by each individual to keep mastering this desire. Such, for instance, was the Greek. Plato shows it in a hundred places. Plato, who knew his contemporaries, and himself. 19. The methods employed by the ascetic priest, which we have already learned to know, stifling of all vitality, mechanical energy, the little joy, and especially the method of love your neighbor, herd organization, the awaking of the communal consciousness of power to such a pitch that the individual is disgusted with himself becomes eclipsed by his delight in the thriving of the community. These are, according to modern standards, the innocent methods employed in the fight with depression. Let us turn now to the more interesting topic of the guilty methods. The guilty methods spell one thing, to produce emotional excess, which is used as the most efficacious anesthetic against their depressing state of protracted pain. This is why priestly ingenuity has proved quite inexhaustible in thinking out this one question. By what means can you produce an emotional excess? This sounds harsh. It is manifest that it would sound nicer and would grate on one's ears less if I were to say, forsooth, the ascetic priest made use at all times of the enthusiasm contained in all strong emotions. But what is the good of still soothing the delicate ears of our modern effeminates? What is the good on our side of budging one single inch before their verbal pecksniffianisms? 
For us psychologists to do that would be at once practical Pecksniffianism, apart from the fact of its nauseating us. The good taste, others might say the righteousness, of a psychologist nowadays consists, if at all, in combating the shamefully moralized language with which all modern judgments on man and things are smeared. For do not deceive yourself. What constitutes the chief characteristic of the modern souls and of modern books is not the lying, but the innocence, which is part and parcel of their intellectual dishonesty. The inevitable running up against this innocence everywhere constitutes the most distasteful feature of this somewhat dangerous business which a modern psychologist has to undertake. It is a part of our great danger. It is a road which perhaps leads straight to the great nausea. I know quite well the purpose which all modern books will and can serve. Granted that they last, which I am not afraid of, and granted equally that there is to be some future day a generation with a more rigid, more severe, and healthier taste, the function which all modernity generally will serve with posterity, that of an emetic, and this by reason of its moral sugariness and falsity, its ingrained feminism, which it is pleased to call idealism, and at any rate believes to be idealism. Our cultured men of today, our good men, do not lie, that is true, but it does not redound to their honor. The real lie, the genuine, determined, honest lie, on whose value you can listen to Plato, would prove too tough and too strong an article for them by a long way. It would be asking them to do what people have been forbidden to ask them to do, to open their eyes to their own selves, and to learn to distinguish between true and false in their own selves. The dishonest lie alone suits them. Everything which fools a good man is perfectly incapable of any other attitude to anything than that of a dishonorable liar, an absolute liar, but nonetheless an innocent liar, a blue-eyed liar, a virtuous liar. These good men, they are all now tainted with morality through and through, and as far as honor is concerned, they are disgraced and corrupted for all eternity. Which of them could stand a further truth about man? Or, put more tangibly, which of them could put up with a true biography? One or two instances. Lord Byron composed a most personal autobiography, but Thomas More was too good for it. He burnt his friend's papers. Dr. Gwinner, Schopenhauer's executor, is said to have done the same, for Schopenhauer as well wrote much about himself, and perhaps also against himself. Eyes a o on. The virtuous American Thayer, Beethoven's biographer, suddenly stopped his work. He had come to a certain point in that honorable and simple life and could stand it no longer. Moral, what sensible man nowadays writes one honest word about himself? He must already belong to the order of holy foolhardiness. We are promised an autobiography of Richard Wagner, who doubts but that it would be a clever autobiography. Think forsooth of the grotesque horror which the Catholic priest Jansen aroused in Germany with his inconceivably square and harmless pictures of the German Reformation. What wouldn't people do if some real psychologist were to tell us about a genuine Luther? Tell us not with the moralist simplicity of a country priest or the sweet and cautious modesty of a Protestant historian, but say with the fearlessness of a tain that springs from force of character and not from a prudent toleration of force. The Germans, by the by, have already produced the classic specimen of this toleration. They may well be allowed to reckon him as one of their own, in Leopold Ranke, that born classical advocate of every causa fortior, that cleverest of all the clever opportunists. End of section 6